other ones. Wonderful Caverns, PA, 1880. Prehistoric remains lately found in Missouri and Ohio. Um, this is one that I left out of my Missouri episode on purpose, knowing I would get to this very episode, and here we are today, so I could read it here. Um, if you haven't seen my Missouri episode, I strongly recommend it. Missouri is one of the biggest um, chock full states, similar to Ohio, but really lays the groundwork for, you know, they find a huge city, intact city, 300 feet below ground. Streets, fountains, buildings, everything. And um, as well as all the other things with the mounds and the buried buildings and the 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 under the underground tunnels and you know the kind of um, Egyptian esque um, tunnel systems and and statues they find underground in Missouri and and uh, Illinois is quite crazy. So this fir- first part here is going to be from Missouri, but if you've seen that episode, it, it, it'll be great. And if you haven't, then you'll get a little taste of what my Missouri episode holds. So here we go. A correspondent describes a cave recently explored in Monroe County, Mrs. Missouri. It is in a limestone ridge at the headwaters of Salt River, which empties into the Mississippi. Now, this this is a good article because it's one author showing you the similarities that exist in multiple locations along the Mississippi. This ridge is known in the locality as the Narrows, and its rocky bluffs rising to the height of 200 feet present a bold and picturesque scene. It has had a local fame on account of the many Indian curiosities found there. Indian mounds are numerous on the rocky ledge, and Indian skulls, arrowheads, flint hammers, and iron and stone hatchets have been found in considerable numbers. A recent discovery there caused a correspondent to visit Mr. Waldron, the owner of the land, and this account is given of an exploration. Without much difficulty, I found Mr. Waldron, the discoverer of the temple, on whose land it is situated. He proposed, as it was late, that I should remain with him during the night and walk over and see the temple in the morning. I assented, and after supper, Mr. Waldron brought out some articles that he had found in the temple for my inspection. They were a bronze hatchet or hammer having an eye and a heavy knob on the hammer portion, a rude bronze lance or arrowhead more than six inches in length, a piece of deer or elk horn about nine inches in length from which small branches were given off and an elliptical piece of bronze on which was cut in a rude manner an imitation of the sun and some alphabetical characters closely resembling Phoenician. The next morning, Mr. Waldron and his two sons and I set out to visit the temple. Our way lay through a low bottom covered with a dense growth dense growth of timber we soon found ourselves before the cleft in the rock and after lighting a torch we entered the arch is elliptical and for gracefulness of curve and beauty of finish is not excelled by any of the works of the present day again this table this temple hidden in this mountain is so exquisite it's not excelled by any of the works of present day each stone is of the finest granite polished as smooth as glass and they sent back reflections of our torches like polished steel the springer rests on an intablature which is placed on the capital of a beautiful column also hewn from granite The keystone of the arch projects from the inferior stones and seems to have been finished with the view of placing an inscription thereon, but this was never done. 
Passing under the arch, we found ourselves in a room hewn out of solid limestone, 35 feet wide, 50 feet long, 30 feet high, and vaulted to the center, the ceiling being 45 feet from the floor to the middle of the room. At intervals of 10 feet are graceful, slender columns of granite with square base fantastically carved in imitation of some unknown plant. The shafts, like the shafts supporting the arch, are supported by a capital. Upon this rests a heavy intablature of magnesium limestone, which is closely fitted under the roof and gives the column the appearance of supporting the ceiling. The acoustic properties of the temple are remarkable. A whisper can be heard from one end of the room to the other. There are 12 columns in the temple, six on each side. Between the columns on each side of the temple and on each side of the arch, or entrance to the temple, are set into the wall blocks of polished gray and black granite, but there is no inscription on any of them. No sculpture of any kind, except the plants mentioned above, has been discovered. At the western portion of the room is a dais, or raised platform of polished limestone, which supports a huge block of granite, 5 feet long and 24 inches thick. On this is laid a slab of polished and beveled granite, smoother than marble. This slab projects over the block beneath it about 6 inches on all sides and is 6 feet long and 3 feet wide. Evidently, this was an altar, for there are ashes scattered around. What was the character of the sacrifice? To the right of the altar is a small anteroom, which you enter through an arched doorway, evidently intended for the priest who attended to the duties of the altar. About this, there is nothing destructive. It is not even certain by what means it was shut off from the auditorium. The place is wonderfully dry. The ravages of time have not in the least impaired it, and every portion retains the freshness and glow that it had when it came from the hands of the workmen. It is undoubtedly one of the great curiosities of the age and is attracting the attention of archaeologists. An exhaustive report is now being prepared by a committee which is to be presented to the Historical Society of the State of Missouri, that it will add fresh interest to the study of the civilization that preceded the present Indian tribes of this country seems probable. Tablets, carving, and mummies in an Ohio cave. So that wrapped up the Missouri part, and now we're jumping to the Ohio part. Again, this is a long one, so thank you for sticking with me. I know it can be a little a little boring, but this is a five-star article, one of my favorites. So again, tablets, carvings, and mummies in an, uh, in an Ohio cave. Adams County, Ohio is rich in remains of prehistoric mounds and fortifications and is the mecca of enthusiastic archaeologists. Most of the mounds are on alluvial bottom lands of the Ohio River. 17 miles northeast of Manchester is a prehistoric cavern in which wonderful discoveries have lately been made of great interest to the scientific world. They throw much light on the character and habits of this remarkable people evidences of whose high civilization have been preserved to us. A correspondent of the New York Sun lately visited this cavern and gives this description of recent discoveries. The entrance to the cave is choked up with the debris of ages, but traces of a flight of steps are to be seen. The entrance is at the bottom of a sinkhole, which is nearly in the center of a level field. This field is 200 acres in extent 
and is bounded on all sides by lofty hills. It is about 25 feet from the surface of the ground to the bottom of the cave. I have been unable to learn when this cave was first discovered. It was known to the earliest settlers, and they no doubt learned of its existence from the Indians. It contains nine chambers or rooms. These apartments are connected by narrow galleries. All but the third one from the entrance are mathematically regular in shape, being each about 30 feet in length, 20 feet in width, and 15 feet in height. The galleries are of the same height as the main rooms, but are only six feet wide. The excavation passes through a solid ledge of freestone, which is bisected about 100 feet from the mouth by a vein of limestone. The chamber where the limestone crops out is of irregular shape. The water has oozed through the limestone rock for ages and formed thousands of beautiful stalactites and stalagmites. The cave is much visited by picnic parties, and every corner of it has been thoroughly explored a thousand times. Now, this is important because I've talked about a lot of these cave systems that show not only regular mathematical structure, but a kind of organic looking structure. And But the fact that you have a perfect description of a mathematically shaped room, obviously either built or carved or both, that had then been filled with stalactites and stalagmites really gives an idea of the age that we're dealing with. Again, they don't talk about the height, but if it's filled with thousands of stalactites and stalagmites, well, I mean, you know, again, depending on the flow, the water flow p- plays a big part, but you can calculate... Um, how long or how old stalactites and stalagmites are to within an approximate age. But just the appearance of them shows the antiquity of this room. The fourth chamber has a deep well in one corner, at the bottom of which is a stream of water. The depth of the well is unknown, but it must be several hundred feet. A few days ago, a party of gentlemen paid a visit to this cave equipped to explore this mysterious well. Forty-five feet from the top of the well, they found the entrance to a second cavern, which proved to be the family tomb of a race of gigantic men. A narrow gallery, which expanded as they left the well behind them, opened into a lofty chamber, 225 feet long and a hundred and ten feet wide. The floors, walls, and roof of this immense room are smoothly finished. In the center of the apartment is a sarcophagus and mausoleum combined. The mausoleum at its base measures 55 by 35 feet. It is of simple though beautiful design and carved out of the solid rock. Its base is parallel on all sides. These panels containing bas reliefs, which are supposed to illustrate the four seasons in man's life, childhood, youth, manhood, and old age. At the ends of the bas reliefs are tables full of written characters resembling the Hebrew. Presume presumed to be memoriams of the person or persons in whose honor the mausoleum is erected. The carving on the panels is of the most delicate description and is fully equal to the Grecian school of sculpture. In the limits of a newspaper article, they cannot be described as they deserve. From the floor to the top of this base is six feet. The base is hollowed out at the four corners, and these excavations are covered with slabs of free stone, accurately fitted and so firmly cemented that a cold chisel struck with a heavy hammer made little or no impression on the cement. They are uniform in size, measuring five by 12 feet. 
In the center of the mausoleum rises a couch, two feet, five inches in height, 12 feet in length, and five feet in width. On this couch is extended the figure of a man. It is probably life size and measures nine feet, four inches in length. The limbs are finely proportioned and disposed in an easy and graceful manner. The arms are folded across the breast, and the fingers clasp a bunch of leaves. Remember, we read from an article the same thing, the exact same thing. A a giant over nine feet. This is a totally separate article. A giant found close to nine feet with a winged helmet grasping leaves in his hand, resembling oak. The figure is partially nude, a mantle or scarf crossing the breast and falling over the loins in graceful folds. The face is one of great strength and beauty, and the outline and contour are decidedly Israelitish. 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 Israelites, nine foot tall Grecian Israelites. Hmm. The head is covered. Again, this is important. This is why I pointed this out when I read the shorter article that was from a different mound. This is not a mound. This is a temple. We're in a different place. So again, the helm, he's got the same exact. He's dressed almost identically as the man they found in the mound. So the helm was elegantly chased and kept in position by rods of metal. Okay, so the winged helm. The hell head is covered with a winged. It looks like I clipped some of it off. Okay, winged helm, elegantly chased and kept in position by rods of the same metal. At each corner of the mausoleum rises a covered pyramidal column surmounted by caps that are unmistak- unmistakably dory. I don't know what that is. D O R I E. Anybody in chat maybe knows. On two sides of the room are tombs of humbler design. They are side by side, uniform in size, and 20 in number, 10 on a side. Like the mausoleum, they are carved out of the solid rock and embellished with boss relief. On the front of each is, is a raised scroll covered with written characters similar to those on the panels of the mausoleum. So Hebraic, Phoenician, Hebraic, Phoenician. On the wall of the room opposite to the entrance are painted 25 faces. They are faded and blurred, but still distinct enough to be deciphered. The colors used are red, yellow, black, and white, and were mixed with oil. The portraits are executed in a superior manner, and that the anatom- the an- anatomical proportions of the features is preserved to an exact degree. The explorers opened one of the small tombs. It contained a splendidly preserved mummy, swathed in cloth, covered with a thick varnish, which emits a pleasant aroma odor, not unlike balsam of fur. The mummy measures nine feet one inch in length, and the cloth with which it is wrapped, although of coarse texture, is skillfully woven. One of the part partially cut, one of the party cut the wrappings from the face, but did it so clumsily that the head crumbled into dust. Portions of the hair remain sticking to the cloth and your correspondent has some of it before him while this article is being written. It is black, curly, and of fine texture. Besides the body of the giant, the tomb contained a spearhead, a hatchet, two lances, three mattocks or hose, a spade, a cup, two plates, and a small urn all of copper. The smallest cup 
and one of the lances have been shown to your correspondent. These wonderful people understood the secret of hardening copper, for an ordinary file will barely scratch the lance, and the edge of a cold chisel turns up like lead when struck against it. The cup is of a softer metal and beautifully engraved with trailing vines and wreaths. A square package at the head of the tomb, wrapped in the varnished cloth, contained a book of 100 leaves of thin copper, fastened loosely at the top, and crowded with finely engraved characters similar to those already described. Thanks for sticking with me. We're almost there, guys. But it's, it's, again, this is one of my favorite articles of all time. The sun representative visited the cave and examined it thoroughly. The upper cave was evidently the cellar of a house above ground and used for domestic purposes or as a place of retreat in case of an attack by an enemy. So you get what they're saying here. They're saying that the first rooms that they excavated are not excavated but explored before they went down the well and found this even further buried was the cellar to a house so a stone house that lied on the surface but was destroyed who knows burnt taken away by a flood no idea but this tomb again 40 feet below that one that was already 25 feet below surface level right crazy. In the first two chambers and in the last five are many curious blocks of stone shaped like tables and bricks which have their their two of their two four been thought of natural origin. The marks of chisel and pick are found on them. However, these artificial agents formed the whole cavern. The irregularity of the limestone chamber is due to natural causes. In all probability, this room was dry when the wonderful people who designed and built it were alive. The stalactites and stalagmites have formed since. I measured one of the largest of the former. Okay, perfect. They get into this. It was five feet six and one half inches from the base to the apex, allowing that it lengthened at the rate of one inch every 50 years, which a geological friend tells me is very rapid. It would have been 3,325 years reaching its present length. Conjecture alone can fix the date of the last occupancy of the cave. It must have been years before the stalactites began to form, of course. The owner of the farm on which the cave is situated has associated with himself several gentlemen of capital, and they intend opening the tombs and the big mausoleum, putting stairways and then advertising the curiosities and throwing the cave open to the general public. Mr. Grooms is anxious to have the cave examined by an expert, and an account of the discoveries, together with the engraved book and the tools found in the tomb, will be at once forwarded to the Smithsonian Institution. Yeah, we know what happened after that. This, I mean, I, I again, for for my listeners that have been with me for a long time, how many of these amazing stories end with, we forwarded it to the Smithsonian, and then you never hear about it again. You just never hear about it. But yeah, that was long-winded, but I hope it was it was worth uh, listening to that. Um, unbelievable. And this is going to kind of lead us into the wrapping up of this episode where we start to kind of talk a little bit more about what I have been correlating and saying that, you know, the the stories of the Bible that we've traced all the way from California, even, even Alaska, right? The largest ancient vessel ever found was found in Alaska. And we, we covered that in, in, in episode one. And the Native Americans, the Indians of Alaska, who were aware of the story of Noah, but they obviously had their own descriptions. They even said that it was Noah's Ark. The ship was 1,200 feet long. And we talk about 
some of these scriptural references and some of these overlays that these quote Native Americans that their stories of their forefathers and the people that came before them they talk about a deluge they talk about these things they have these biblical stories there are so many endless overlays and then again going back with what lies below right in this article so amazingly shows in so many of my other episodes again hundreds of now you know episode or almost 20 episodes in and i've only shared you know one percent of what i've found throughout those you know 20 episodes about two hours each worth of material but it's building quite a uh, an amazing story